Hey everybody, what's happening? It's Will and James here, PAX 2016. Yo. We're here with Jeremy, the CEO and creative director of Tales of Illyria. Tell us a little bit about this game, wherever you'd like to start, for those people who don't know what Tales of Illyria is. Uh, it's actually Chron Chronicles of Illyria. Chron Chronicles. Chron That's okay, it's very close. Um, in short, Chronicles of Illyria is a, uh, it's a new take on massively multiplayer online role-playing games. Uh, we like to tell people, take everything they think they know about what MMOs are today, and kind of flip it upside down, and that's kind of what Chronicles of Illyria is. And we didn't do that intentionally, that wasn't what we set out to do. We, we didn't take a, a checklist of games and be like, let's just do the opposite of these. What we did is we started from the very beginning. We took a look at some of the problems that exist in, in MMOs today, and we tried to systematically solve those problems in new, innovative ways, kind of from the, from the ground up. And, uh, uh, and we spent a lot of time on it. The game has actually been in design for over 10 years. Wow. We just didn't have the resources to really take it further than that for a long time. It was just kind of a brainchild, a dream, and I guess now we're kind of living the dream. But uh, we, we took the uh, the problems that we saw and we, we came up with innovative systems for it and made sure that they fit together with the rest of the mechanics. Uh, and here we are, we're with a game that, that looks and feels and plays very different from any other MMO, but it's, it's very exciting for people. It is very exciting because, I mean, 10 years, you said, so I mean, a game can can go through many different stages of development, but I love the fact that you guys are still pounding it out and getting to it. James, what do you think? Uh, what is the progression system like? Since it is an MMO, that's a huge question. So the progression system in this game, it's not item-based, it's not equipment-based, it's all skill-based, it's, uh, it's not a class-based game, it's all skill-based. Uh, but one of the things that we're doing different with this game is, is, you know, it's an MMO, so we want it to be social, we want it to be interactive. So unlike a lot of games where, you know, you, you grind, you practice the skill over and over again, and then you go to a trainer and they're like, well, here's the next yeah. skill. It gets a bit redundant. It gets a little bit redundant, yeah. You know, like, you, you kind of learned it as you did it. Well, we embrace that idea. So what you do in this game, actually, is you go find another player. Or you can use an NPC trainer if you want. Somebody who knows the skill that you're looking to learn. And then you go off and you hang out with them. And if it's another player, for example, you go out, and as long as you're with them, you can use some of the skills that they have that you don't have. And then eventually, you can use those skills with other people who are learning to use that skill but don't have it mastered yet. And then eventually, you can use it on your own. And so it's a really kind of social That's kind of what you meant system. by flipping it upside down. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, yeah, it's and it's uh, apprenticeship through friendship. Uh, it really is, yeah. And I play a lot of MMOs, and what always may make or break an MMO is that social element. Like if your guild is gone, you really don't have as much of a reason to play anymore. And so in doing that, you're kind of urging people to hang Stick out with together. other people. Yeah, yeah it's so. awesome. Yeah. yeah, and that's another one of the things that we wanted to solve. Kind of similar, you know, you're talking about when your guilds are gone. You know, what do you do? Yeah. And one of the problems with it, what that we see is, is that I cry. <laughs> yeah, me too. It's kind of an aging market. You know, there are people that have been playing MMOs now for 15 years and we're looking for something a little bit more challenging, but we also have careers and lives and we don't have as much free time as we used to. And so one of the problems that you'll see a lot of times with like the hack and slash games uh, is that, you know, when you're playing by yourself, you know, it's, pr it's pretty normal, you know, you can adapt and, and find your own challenges, but when your friends come online to, let's say, have more time to play, let, you know, they can play twice as much a week for you, yeah. you know, there's generally a, a level difference or some kind of gap, and so, you know, if they come down and play at your level, they're bored, and if you go play at their level, then it's overwhelming, you know, one hit, you're dead kind of thing. Right. And me and my friends, when, when games didn't have a way to answer to that, it's just like, dude, don't play without me, okay? Just make an alternative yeah. character, and it, it kind of sucks, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, one of the ways we're solving that is, is that Chronicles of Valyria has in-game families, like literally families. It's part of the character creation system. Uh, you can choose either to join the game as a player or NPC run family. So you can actually just pick another family to join if they're looking for children. Or you can be a ward and not actually join a family and kind of get a little bit more opportunity to min-max. But if you do choose to join a family, then when your family is online, uh, let's say they had more opportunity to, to play than you did, when you party with them, you actually get bolstered. And so while your stats don't become the same as them, it's equitable to them. So that way you can, you know, it's like you're encouraging each other, you know, you're bolstering each other. So whenever you're alone, you're fine, you know, just set your difficulty according to what you can handle. When you're with them, you can feel good about going and doing whatever they're doing. Yeah. But you can still choose your own path and... Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's really skill-based. Uh, so, you know, we've got six different skill trees. We've got the more traditional, like a, a crafting tree, a gathering tree, and then you've got your survival tree. Uh, this is actually a survival game as well. Uh, and we did, again, we didn't do that because survival games are all the trend right now. We did it because Chronicles of Valyria, the Chronicles part is very important, and we wanted to create a game that feels like and allows you to recreate the emotions and experiences that you might have in one of your favorite fantasy novels. And then to do that, we needed these survival mechanics. So a lot of games uh, automate some of the stuff like a mail system. So you know, you walk up to the post office, little, you put your uh, money right. in, etc., and like a minute later, your item shows up, you know, wherever you're trying to send it. In Chronicles of Valyria, there's no system like that because you know the opportunity to take this package and travel, you know, medium or long distances to deliver it to somebody. There's an opportunity for story as long as interesting things are happening along the way. 
Uh, and so, but you know, that's only true if there's some risk to that. And part of that is the survival mechanics. So while you're in town, you know, things are largely automated. You don't have to worry about eating and drinking and stuff like that. Though there's benefits if you hang out in the tavern. We want the taverns and pubs to be the social experience and not hanging outside the auction house. Yeah. Uh, but if you go outside town, as soon as you leave the gates, hunger, thirst, uh, making sure your temperature is equalized, as well as we have a, a vitality system. And about two and a half to three hours after your character wakes up, they start to fatigue and they become less effective at combat. And if you're waylaid and you've been traveling all day, you're going to be at a disadvantage. So if there's there's a design to make you want to stop at camp for a little while and make sure you have somebody as an outpost so that if you get away late in the middle of the night while your camp is resting, you know, you got somebody to, to raise the alarm and stuff like that. So we're trying really hard to let some of those experiences become a common practice in this game. Which I love because it really makes the players stay on their toes and constantly thinking of what they're doing no matter where they're at or what, what's going on. Yeah, and that's, I think, what a lot of people initially react strongly to in this game is that you know, one of our five design pillars that we've created for this game is that we wanted heroes to have to be truly heroic. You know, we, we're, we're kind of tired of these games. You gotta earn that. You gotta earn it. You know, we don't want everybody hitting level cap, which we don't have levels, but we don't like that idea of everybody hitting level, level cap. And, you know, the difference between one person versus the next is really just how often you grind or how many times you do the same content sure. over and over again. Right. So what we did is, is we've actually scaled the difficulty and, and we've tied that risk and reward system to our business model. So what I mean by that is, is that in Chronicles of Illyria, we don't have a subscription. It's a it's a it's a pay-to-play system. But what you do is, is you 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 take and you get a soul and you buy a spark of life, which is thirty dollars, and you combine those two. And when you combine that spark of life with your soul, you get a new character in the world. And your character, from the moment they're created, over the next ten to fourteen months, will actually age and eventually die. And that's permadeath. The character is dead, uh, and that's the end of their role in the story. But that soul that you use to create the character goes back into the soul chamber uh, and you can use that during character creation uh, to combine it with another spark of life to reincarnate that character. And so over the 10 year period of time that we're running our, our 10 year story, you, you know, could potentially be playing the reincarnated version of that same soul life after life after life. Um, but to make it kind of interesting, when you're out in the world and you're doing things and you get you know, attacked by some evil creature or you fall off a cliff or you know, another player waylays you on the, on the, on the road and they choose to, what's called a coup de grace, they choose to kill you. A killing stroke, it shaves a little bit of time off of that maximum lifespan. You know, so even if you're outside in the cold and you die of hypothermia, you know, that unpreparedness costs you in the long run. And, and so that, that connection between real world money and, and the choices you make in game, we hope, makes those choices really matter. Many, many different layers going on there. there many things lot. happening in the background. I see you guys are coming to Kickstarter May 3rd. Uh, very exciting. Any kind of ETA when we can expect to get our hands on this thing? So, uh, as part of the Kickstarter tier, we are offering access to alphas and betas, primarily because that's what that's what people want. You know, they want to be able to pay for that. And so, we're looking to have our closed alpha, which for us is just an opportunity to get a couple hundred players in and give us feedback, you know, while the game is still in development. You know, it's pretty easy when you're in a game like this to get kind of tunnel vision. And we want to make sure that, you know, as close as the team is to the game, we never lose track of the big picture, which is making the game fun and entertaining. So that we're hoping to have uh, as late as end of this year, maybe early next year. And then we've got rolling opportunities for an open alpha to give streamers, you know, YouTubers an, op an opportunity to get their hands on it. And then ultimately our beta is probably the end of next year. And what platforms are you developing for? Right now we're developing on and for Windows, but we're using the Unreal Engine for our client, which has uh, compatibility, cross-platform compatibility. So, you know, we haven't closed any doors on doing Mac, Linux, or consoles either. Excellent, excellent. James, do you have anything else or are you good? Uh, one more question. Uh, obviously, you have an interesting aesthetic to your game, the appearances and everything. It kind of has like this beautiful dissonance about it. Uh, do you, would you say that's true and what your inspiration was for that? Yeah, um, we are looking for something that's kind of got a, a low to mid fantasy vibe. So it feels kind of like, you know, a, a more conan environment. But we also want to, we want to, we want to, we want to, you know, bring it up a notch too. So there are also elements that show up in the world that are kind of mid to high fantasy, but we want those things to be rare and fantastic. We don't want them to be commonplace. Well, especially when you have death looming in your face, you know, that, that whole permadeath thing and, and that your character ages. I think that that would all blend really well. It was an excellent decision. And all of that was very interesting and I can't wait to look into it more. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, thank you guys. Thank yeah. you. Uh, so look out for Chronicles of Valyria coming soon and check out Kickstarter if you get a chance. Keep it here for Press Start TV. Jerry, like, thank you so subscribe, much. Subscribe, comment, and berate Will in the comments section for saying Tales of Illyria. Yeah, so yeah, it's all good. Yeah, it's That's payback right. for him. You know what? Yeah. More people are gonna remember the name now. So it's all <laughs> yeah, there you go. Chronicles of Illyria. Stay tuned.